probably about time we start putting some courses on the internet and uh, I think dynamics is a very popular one. People want to know about how vorticity works and uh, how upper level lift works, uh, vertical velocity, all that stuff. So let's check some of that out. In the background here you can see precipitable water. This is a NAM plot showing the conditions uh, this after or this evening. We've had very poor chase conditions and very little severe weather and that's because of a lack of moisture in the U.S. We've been kind of shut out by a big Hudson Bay vortex but some of that moisture is starting to make it up from the south right there. So what you're seeing here with precipitable water this is basically you take a column from the ground all the way up to the stratosphere and this tells you how much precipitation you would get if you could rain all of that water vapor out of the column. Okay, let's start with the very basics, temperature and moisture. Temperature, we can kind of consider that the amount of hotness or coldness that we measure with a thermometer, and it's a scale or quantity. So let me show you uh, the units here. Here in the US, we use Fahrenheit, so we get a value of 212 for boiling and 32 degrees Fahrenheit for freezing. Okay, Celsius is a little bit simpler. Freezing is zero and boiling is 100. But with Kelvin units, and you notice something unusual about Kelvin, there's no degree symbol here. That's because Kelvin is the unit. It's uh, 273 Kelvin, not two. 273 degrees Kelvin. There's no such thing. So keep that in mind and that'll kind of make you an expert here with temperature. So you want to keep this number in mind here. 273. And if you just keep in mind that that is the freezing temperature, that makes conversions very, very simple. So just as a test, 30 degrees Celsius. What is that in uh, Kelvin? Just add 30 to 273 and we get 303. So pretty simple there. So here are some very useful conversions and if you memorize these you'll be able to convert almost anything. So for example if we have 20 degrees Celsius that's going to be 68 Fahrenheit. And likewise, 32 Fahrenheit, that's going to be 0 Celsius, or 273 Kelvin. So, memorize that, and uh, that'll help you out quite a bit. Okay, here's an example of temperature gradient. See, now we're getting into gradient. This is uh, stepping things up a little bit. So, the red here is isotherms, which are uh, temperatures. And we're seeing units every 3 degrees Celsius. And you see down here, we've got a 21 degrees Celsius isotherm. And then we have 18, 15, 12, and 9. And you notice that some areas have the isotherms packed very close together, like here over New York and Pennsylvania. So this is a temperature gradient. We've got close or we have, we've got cold air in very close proximity to warm air. Elsewhere, very weak temperature gradient right in here. So the warm air is quite a distance from the cold air. Okay, so here's temperature gradient in a mathematical form. So what we see here is the change in temperature over the change in distance gives us the gradient. So if we have a very large temperature contrast over a very small distance, that makes this part of the equation large, so we end up with a very large value. So keep in mind that when we deal with gradients, we're talking about Fahrenheit degrees or Celsius degrees for our gradient, not degrees Fahrenheit or degrees Celsius. So when we're talking about a change over a certain distance, maybe the difference is 
10 degrees across 50 miles, we would talk about 10 Fahrenheit degrees across that distance, not 10 degrees Fahrenheit difference. Okay, so this is an example of temperature gradient. Once again, here we're looking at Asia, and you can see that the temperature gradient across the Pacific in this region here is very uh, spread apart, very weak. This is what we call a weak temperature gradient. And here in the Himalayas, we have a very tight temperature gradient. And that's because we go from warm air at low elevations to cold air in this plateau region in Tibet. So we can also have very strong temperature contrast in the vertical. And that's something that we call lapse rate. And here you see an example of a very large temperature contrast. We have very warm air near the ground. Temperature there at the ground is about 28 degrees Fahrenheit or 20. Temperature right in that, in that area is about 28 degrees Celsius, which is about 82. Fahrenheit. And that contrasts very sharply with up at about 18,000 feet, we have about minus 15 Celsius. So between that warm ground and very cold mid-levels, we have what we call a very steep lapse rate. So a high lapse rate is called a steep lapse rate. And here's an example of a weak lapse rate. You see a weaker temperature change with height, and here it's even more weak. So the temperature change per unit of height is a lot less. And you notice here in the Arctic, this is at Inuvik on the Arctic Ocean coast, here the layer has a very low lapse rate. In fact, in fact, the lapse rate shows temperature increasing with height, and that's what we call an inversion. So when the layer slopes like that, that indicates an inversion. When the layer slopes like this, we have a weak lapse rate, and when it's like that, we have a steep lapse rate. So we just look at a layer and try to figure out what kind of slope we have in there. This shows in this layer, the slope is like that. So that's kind of a weak lapse rate. And then below that here, we have an inversion. So this here is also called a negative lapse rate. And here, this is called a positive lapse rate. And here's an example of a layer that is isothermal. So it's not really negative or positive. It would have to be way over here to be negative. It would have to be over here to be positive. And this kind of follows these isotherms right here. Here's what lapse rate looks like. We have the Greek letter gamma. And this is showing us that the change in temperature over the change in vertical distance gives us the lapse rate right there. And there's the normal expression of lapse rate, Celsius degrees per kilometer. So the standard lapse rate in a typical atmosphere, there's the values right there. So for every kilometer you go up, you lose five Celsius degrees. So here's an example of temperature. This was a very hot day back in 2011. This was July 9th up in Oklahoma there. And this is actually different from heat. Heat is actually the transfer of energy. And there's what 110 degrees looks like outside. This was my old house there in Oklahoma. Some of you might have done the forecasting classes there. This is the same place and that was kind of a brutal summer there. But this is actually different from heat. Temperature and heat physically, those are two different things. Heat is energy transferred between two different systems because of temperature differences. And some units that we might use, joules or calories.
And one important thing about heat, it can raise the temperature or change the state of substances in a system. So this here is a source of sensible heat. This is me out on Lake Thunderbird and the lake right there. That's a system, which means you can add heat and it can give heat to the atmosphere up above. And on that day, I was out with uh, Jim Ledoux. He's a forecaster there at the Warning Decision Training Branch up in Norman. So yeah, the lake right there, that's a source of heat, very important to uh, water bodies. Those have play a major effect in forecasting. So this lake right here, it has sensible heat, which means we can, we can feel it and measure it with a thermometer. And heat is proportional to mass, which means if you have a very large body with a lot of depth maybe, that can contribute, contribute a lot more heat to the atmosphere. And with a shallow lake like this one, a few feet deep, that's not going to have much of an impact. This is a view of New Orleans that I took from a flight to Atlanta from Houston. And you can see the Lake Pontchartrain Causeway. And this is showing some sources of heat. One thing to keep in mind is water has specific heat three times as much as land which means it can contribute a greater temperature change to the atmosphere compared to the uh, land. That also means that the uh, water takes a lot more effort to heat up, whereas land will heat up right away as soon as the uh, sun comes out. And then another source of heat is latent heat. And that's a kind of heat that's stored within the molecules. So we have upward motion in this storm here. We have water vapor flowing into the storm right there. We have condensation, which produces visible water. That condensation process, it releases heat into the atmosphere. So we call that latent heat. And then elsewhere within a thunderstorm cloud, we have precipitation falling out into the air so we get evaporation, and that evaporation requires heat. So it absorbs heat and it cools the air, and we end up with a very cold downdraft reaching the surface. So here's a diagram from Wikipedia showing the three phases of water. And these are the higher energy states up at the top, and these are the lower energy states. So. The lowest energy state of water is going to be solid. That's going to be ice. In between, we just have plain old water, liquid. And then the uh, higher energy state of water is going to be water vapor. And water vapor is a gas, which means it's in the air around you. you there's some in the room that you're in right now. You can't see it, but it's there. It's uh, just like helium or hydrogen. And that's a gas, and that's what we call water vapor. When we go up to a higher energy state, that absorbs energy from the surrounding air, and the temperature of the system drops as a result. So if we have water that evaporates out of the base of a cloud and turns into water vapor, that shields that parcel of air. Same thing when we melt ice that requires energy, so we have cooling going on. And same thing with sublimation when we go from ice to water vapor. And then the other way is when we go down, that releases latent heat into the atmosphere rather than absorbs it. So when we go from a gas to a liquid, that's condensation, that's gonna release a lot of heat into the atmosphere, a lot of sensible heat. So when we go from a gas to a liquid, we go from water vapor to plain old water, and that's going to release heat into the atmosphere, latent heat. And same thing when we freeze water, that's going to release a little bit of heat into the atmosphere. And same thing when we go from water vapor to ice, deposition, that's going to release heat 
And that's all for this installment. Uh, next, in our next dynamics lesson, we'll talk a bit about vapor pressure, mixing ratio, humidity, and then we'll get into adiabatic heating and a little bit of soundings, and we'll gradually work our way towards understanding and forecasting dynamics in the atmosphere. So right now we're covering the building blocks. These are, these are the uh, fundamental basics of dynamics and we kind of have to know this before we go on to the more complex stuff. So hopefully you enjoyed it. I know it was a little bit dry, but we'll make an expert out of you in dynamics. So until next time, take care.